You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. The fights became so every day where in the morning we would open the yards up at 8 o'clock and you could hear boom, 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 shots going off all around throughout the buildings. We didn't have outside eyes on us. Whatever we did in that prison, the governor, you know, gave us the seal of approval. We had more violence at Corcoran State Prison than all the nation's prisons put together. More killings, more shootings, more violence. Think about that, than all the nation's prisons put together. I mean, Charles Manson never looked into the camera and took responsibility for anything. He always blamed it on somebody else. He blamed it on the girls. He blamed it on the blacks. And I started going into files at nighttime with a flashlight and looking, getting the documents and the pictures and all the evidence. And I was accumulating all this evidence, James, to 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 try to go up my chain of command, to have my chain of command hold these officers accountable, right? But my chain of command was telling me and my lieutenant, keep your mouth shut. That's just the way it is here in court. But what is right? Am I going to be able to live with myself? Because I was going to kill somebody and 100% get away with it. I was about to be promoted to sergeant. I was 100% going to get away with it. But could I live with myself, James? And I get word that uh, the officers involved put a hit on me to be killed. And uh, so I'm still having to go work in this prison with 6,000 inmates. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Richard Caruso. How are you, Richard? Hey, James. How are you? I'm, I'm honoured to be a guest on your show. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Yeah. Former prison officer, whistleblower who exposed one of America's toughest prisons, the corruption, the murders, all the stuff that went along with it. Like, you're one of the first to ever step forward and expose the prison system. So fair play for that. First and foremost, how are you, Richard? I'm doing really good, James. And like I said, it's an honor to be on your show. I know you tackle the tough topics and I'm honored that you took an interest in my story. Yeah, it's very interesting. People are interested in this stuff, especially inside the information of what really goes on in the prison system. And too many people would have been scared to come forward, like you who done that and worked with the FBI. Your life was put at risk, but thankfully nothing happened. Um, but Richard, I always go back to, before we get into everything, I always go back to the start with my guests, get a bit more information about you, where you grew up and how it all began. I grew up in a small town in upstate New York in a big Italian family. And, um, you know, my father was loved in the community. You know, we never wanted to tarnish our father's name. And then from there, I went into the Marine Corps and worked uh, as a military policeman in the United States Marine Corps because I wanted to be a police officer. And then after I got out of the Marine Corps, I saw how much they were paying prison guards out in California. And um, I never thought I'd be working inside a prison. So I put my application in, got out of the Marine Corps to work in the prisons out in California. My first prison was outside of Sacramento, California. It was a new prison called Mule Creek State Prison. During the late 80s is when this happened, right around 1987, it was a prison boom. And, you know, in America, in certain states, it was all about build more prisons, build more prisons, and throw away the key. Even on nonviolent drug offenders, you know, it was a big business. And uh, so they were building lots of prisons in California. And all throughout the Central Valley, a lot of those a lot of those small agricultural towns became prison towns because they had three or four prisons that surrounded that town. So their economy was fueled by the Department of Corrections. So the first prison I worked at was Mule Creek State Prison. It had about 5,000 inmates, and it was a level three prison. And, and in the United States, we have level one, level two, level three, and level four. And then we have what's called the SHU, which is a security housing unit. And at the time, uh, that would kind of be like the whole of the whole. They're locked down 
23 out of 24 hours a day, you know, um, and uh, they don't have like day room privileges. They don't have anything in their cells, you know, but the minimal. And um, at the time back before uh, the prison boom in San Quentin, Tehachapi and Folsom State Prison, they had what was called the adjustment centers. And that's where they would put like validated prison gang members like the Aryan Brotherhood, the Mexican Mafia, the Nuesta Familia, the Black Guerrilla Family, prison gangs that were formed in prison, street gangs like the Crips, the Bloods, uh, 18th Street, all that stuff, that doesn't go in prison. The prison gangs run the prisons. The street gangs do what the prison gangs say. So if you're a skinhead or if you're a white supremacist and you're coming into a California prison, the Aryan Brotherhood is going to be calling the shots. Or if you're part of a Latino gang in California and you come in the California Department of Corrections, more likely the MA, EME, Mexican Mafia is going to be calling the shots. So the prison that I started at was a level three. And um, it just wasn't satisfying for me. I didn't, I, I just got out of the Marine Corps, James, and I was all about young, dumb, and you know what, wanting to kick ass and take names. And uh, between, I had a mentality of us and them. They were, they were the enemy and we were the good guys. And uh, so I soon found out that you couldn't exist with that mentality that you had to have a mentality of a gray area, especially when you're dealing, trying to manage grown men. And um, so I formulated a system. I mean, I'm six foot four, 290 pounds. And immediately a convict would think that, well, this guy's going to come in here and try to be a bully. And um, I never conducted myself that way. I always, you know, I, you got, I got your attention by my appearance but once I came in, I would usually let the older convicts run the unit and um, I would be basically managing them. And uh, so the shot callers that were running the gangs, you know, like a Michael Thompson, I seen an interview that you have with Michael Thompson from the Aryan Brotherhood. I know him very well. He uh, he was in one of my units, the PHU at Corcoran. Someone like him, I would let manage the, the whites in that unit because they would look up to him and they would look for guidance and, and, you know, dealing with shot callers or dealing with guys that are calling the shots in those units. I know they got somebody's radio up in their cell that doesn't belong to them. I know they probably got tobacco up there. They don't want me up in their house. They don't want me bothering them. So as long as they're keeping peace in my unit, I know I'm not going to change them. So I just want peace. I don't want anybody getting hurt. I want the unit clean. When my sergeant or lieutenant walks in the building, I want somebody sweeping with the broom. I want them to make me look good and we'll have peace in that unit. And um, that's how I conducted myself. I, I never conducted myself as a bully. But um, whenever there was a situation in the prison, being such a big guy, I was always called upon as far as being the shield man or the first person to go in that cell to take, take out combatants. Yeah. So when I was at Mule Creek, when I was at Mule Creek, the first prison, like I said, it didn't stimulate me enough. And I heard about this prison they were building down in the Central Valley called Corcoran. And what it was going to be, it was going to be a maximum security, security housing unit. And they were going to take all the guys out of San Quentin, Tehachapi, and Folsom, the whole, and they were going to bring them down to Corcoran. Now, when they were up in the, those prisons, when they went to yard, the yards up there are the size of handball courts, okay? So down in Corcoran, we had about 20 of those yards the size of handball courts. But if we were cellies up in San Quentin together, say as white boys, we're going to go out with just our race. White boys will go out with the white boys, blacks with the blacks, Hispanics with the Hispanics. So for years, we're looking through that fence wanting to get at these guys and they're looking at the feds wanting to get at us and we're being we're disrespecting each other because we know they can't get us but now they're going to send us to this prison they just built in the central valley knowing we're enemies called corcoran and they're going to house us black white mexican black white mexican so what do you think when that when we go to yard it's going to happen 
when we go out there in that yard, we're going to go after each other. And uh, that's what was occurring. The fights were becoming predictive. And, um, you know, you have people say, well, they didn't have to go out there and fight. And the bottom line is if me and you are sellies, James, um, and I go out there and get attacked by, say, a Hispanic or a black, and if you don't go out there the next day and take care of business, you're going to have to deal with me in the NSL. And that was the culture at Corcoran. Yeah, so what sort of training do you have to do, Richard, to be a prison officer in America? Is it pretty straightforward, um, or is there a lot of training involved? When I when I went through in the uh, mid-'80s, it was kind of a joke. You know, you did six weeks of training, and then they handed you the keys. And when you got to the prison, the officers that had been there for a while kind of said, you know what, forget everything you learned there, and now I'm going to teach you how to survive. And so uh, it was it was kind of a joke, but uh, we had a powerful correctional officer union and uh, our union was the biggest um, financial contributor to the current governor of California. So that's why the pay was so high. And uh, they were all in bed together, like I said, to build more prisons. Each one was greasy in each one's pocket, making money off the prison system by mass incarceration. And, but at the time, I was all loyal to uh, the director of corrections, loyal to my supervisors. I believed in the mission. I wanted to, I was a crime fighter. I was a crime fighter. And I wanted to go to Corker State Prison and I wanted to be a crime fighter. And that's what happened is be careful what you wish for. I was transferred down to Corcoran. And when I got there, it, it was a war zone. From the very first day? from the very first day, because you're bringing these inmates that have been segregated from San Quentin, Folsom, and Tehachapi. Now you're bringing them down into the security housing unit and you're integrating them on the yards. And like I said, for years, they couldn't get to each other out there. So now they have to go out and fight. And you got to understand, James, they didn't, they didn't have weapons. I mean, we're looking up their butthole. We're looking up their nut, behind their nuts. We're looking up their nose. I mean, they don't even have tape in their cells. So, you know, you're not going to find a big shank out there on the yard. Um, so basically, they were fist fights. And what was happening was we would have yard at like 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and then after chow, like say 5 o'clock. And we, the fights became predictable. Do you understand what I'm saying? To where if cell one is a white boy, two white boys, cell two is two African-Americans, and their cellies fall, when we let them out tomorrow, the other cellmates, we know they're going to go out there and fight. So this is what happened to me as I was in the gym one day, and um, I was working out, and there were some police officers working out next to me, and uh, I had some correctional officers that were working out with me. And we started going off over our day. And this is going to sound crazy to you because it is crazy. But we started talking about how our day was going to go. And we said, well, we'll shoot Jones at uh, 8 o'clock. Then we'll shoot Smith at 1. And then uh, Hernandez, we'll shoot him at 5. Because we knew who's coming out. We already knew the fights were going to take place before they were going to happen based on the gang affiliation and based on the prior uh, animosity between the gangs. And so the police officers were like, what do you mean you're going to shoot them? And I was like, well, we have three weapons up there. We have a uh, nine millimeter H and K that shoots an explosive nine millimeter round that will explode inside the inmate. So it doesn't go through an exit and hit the victim. We also have a two, two, three uh, mini 14 round that goes through, will go through you and me and start bouncing around that cement yard. Um, we also have a, a 37 millimeter that shoots the blocks. They're like little wooden blocks that um, there's five of them in a projectile. We call them knee knockers. You, you, you know what I'm talking about, James? Yeah. And basically, they, it's a less than lethal weapon that I would use, and I would shoot that every time, the 37 millimeter, because I didn't feel that I should have to use a lethal weapon to shoot an individual that I know is going to fight. I mean, consciously, I couldn't do it. So what was happening is that the fights became so every day 
where in the morning we would open the yards up at eight o'clock and you could hear boom, 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 shots going off all around throughout the buildings. And, uh, you know, the reports are being written, everybody's doing, it, it became such a normalcy to where when you're involved in war or battle and to the outside world, people would be like, what the hell is going on? But to us, we become desensitized to that. And it becomes a routine where you got the paperwork started. You know, we want to get the paperwork done, clean up the mess, you know, take pictures of the crime scene, whatever. And then on to the next yard. And that was the culture. Uh, how many inmates were in Cochrane? Uh, when I was there, just under 6,000. How many prison officers? We had about 800, about 800, 800 divided into three shifts. So if I was working a yard, there would be three officers on that yard to a thousand inmates with one gun. Now in the security housing unit in the hole, we would have three officers working in there with one gunner. So those inmates are locked down in maximum security. So every time we come into the, the pod or the unit, we're going to their cell to give them toilet paper, to feed them three times a day. Bless you, to feed them three times a day. And um, so everything that inmate gets is us coming to his cell. So you get to know these inmates very well on a daily basis. I had a lot of famous inmates. I had Charles Manson, Sirhan Sirhan, Juan Corona. Here's a, uh, here's a letter from Charles Manson right here. His picture, he gave me this, and you can see on the back where he says Caruso. He's got my name. I got letters from his, I mean, from all these inf infamous inmates. You can see his, the Manson swastika and signature. And these are all his letters. He's got his blood on these letters. He's got his DNA on those letters. But this was the environment that I was in. And James, at the time, I still had that kick-ass, take name mentality where it was us against them. And then I started seeing officers that, that gray area that we talked about, whenever you give somebody power, um, they're, they're, there's individuals that will abuse that power. And if nobody is watching from the outside, you know, whether it's our government, whether it's any organization, if you don't have outside eyes on that organization, you're going to have corruption. So being that we didn't have outside eyes on us, whatever we did in that prison, the governor, you know, gave us the seal of approval. We had more violence at Corcoran State Prison than all the nation's prisons put together. More killings, more shootings, more violence. Think about that than all the nation's prisons put together. So um, that was the environment. And I started seeing these inmates going out on the yard and uh, the, the fights became predictable. What's the method of this happening? What's the method of letting gang members be together? What's the method of having an overpopulated prison? Was it a plan to torture people, kill people, harm people? Was it an experiment? Like, What was the true agenda behind having such an extreme prison with the worst criminals in America? Well, James, that's that's the key question right there. And that's the question that other director of corrections from other states wanted to know, why is California doing this? And I think I had, uh, we had Senate hearings in which I had to testify in front of the California Senate. It changed the department forever. But I think what came out of those, those hearings is what is a big factor to establish, like, say, a TSA, like after 9-11, they established in America this thing called TSA, these screeners, and they pay them this huge money to screen, you know, passengers and to, to we're pumping fear in the public saying, hey, we need this big organization and we need to pay them big money to, to, to kind of, and they use fear. And, and I believe that they were creating this violence at Corcoran to for you as the public, you're hearing about the violence, you're reading it in the paper, you're seeing it in the news, and, and your philosophy is pay these officers whatever you got to pay them. We don't want these animals coming over the walls into our communities. You follow me? They're using violence and fear against the public 
to substantiate making the big money and building more prisons when we could we could we could have controlled it ever since I came forward and the other individuals that that exposed it. We haven't had that violence. They never, they didn't integrate them anymore in the, in the in the security housing unit. So all the violence stopped. Once you once you started sending them out with their own game, we knew what the solution was, but they didn't want to do that. They wanted the violence. How many gangs are in these American prisons, Richard? Uh, there's there's lots of uh, street games, and. Um, well, like I said, the prison gangs, prison gangs are gangs that are made in prison, like the Aryan Brotherhood, the Nuestra Familia, the Mexican Mafia, the uh, Texas Syndicate. These gangs were originated in prison. So I think there's like six or seven prison gangs, but there's so many street gangs. And those street gangs, they just affiliate with one of the prison gangs when they get there, because I know in California, the Hispanics are the majority. So the Mexican mafia runs a lot of the California Department of Corrections, in my opinion. Um, that, that's my opinion. They're very what we call deep because they have the Border Brothers, which are illegal, uh, illegal uh, aliens from uh, Mexico that are over here in the United States illegally, committed crime, and now they're in a California prison and they don't want to go back to Mexico. They're living better in a prison in, in California than they would in Mexico. So the Mexican mafia, instead of those send them on missions to stab somebody, to hurt somebody. And these are soldiers. These are soldiers. They're very dangerous. Did you ever see the movie American Me? Yeah. I had those guys in my unit. Joe Morgan, the one with the peg leg. All, all those guys were in my unit. Very dangerous individuals. Um that uh, are very intelligent. They uh, they have nothing to do all day but to uh, think about how to beat the system, how to work game, how to finance the gang and the prison gang. They're running the streets, drugs on the streets. So if they're not people that you want to get in the way of. And that's why I just was firm but fair. But like I said, I saw, I saw uh, Michael Thompson's interview on your podcast. And the reason it affected me so much was I know him, I know him very well. And he's a very intelligent uh, convict. He's been down for 45 years. He, know, he knows, he, he'll be the first one to tell you that Caruso was up there with that 37 millimeter shooting almost every day. Well, yes, I was because I was shooting the blocks, a less than lethal round. And I was being, we knew the fights were going to happen. And, but when you asked him that one question, James, his response blew me away. Probably about an hour and a half into your interview, you asked him, what was the closest you ever came to death in those 45 years? And he thought about it. And I'm thinking, this guy says he's been shot 22 times. I question that, but if that's what he says, if it's documented, I'll, okay. But what he said was in 1993, there was an inmate named Preston Tate who got his head shot off. Thompson was the clerk, was my clerk, was our clerk in that area. So he was privy to inside information, files, because once the incident happens, we're going to write our reports and we're going to send everything up to Thompson. And Sirhan Sirhan worked in there too. So... When he said he had the inmates' files before the incident even happened, that was a common occurrence because that's how it was. We knew the fights were about to occur. But when he said he was up north and he was going to testify in the Hells Angels trial up there and they pulled him out of the cell and beat him down because they didn't want him to testify in the trial that I was involved in by blowing the whistle on the department, that blew me away. I had no idea that happened. Um, I don't even know if the U.S. attorney knew it happened, but um, that, it really blew me away that uh, that was the closest that he came to death with all the violence that he had been involved in in those 45 years. Yeah. How tough was Michael Thompson? Because when I spoke with him, he seemed like a nice man, genuinely. And But you said that 
these men are the elite of the elite for manipulation. You don't run prison gangs, the Aryan Brotherhood, without being silly. Like, clearly, they've got skills of manipulation and grooming people to be and do what they want. Like, how was Michael Thompson in prison? Was he as fearless as he was back then? Obviously, he changed and had to get into protection, but was he a feared man back in the day? Well, you know, your definition of a feared man and my definition might be different. But my my person, my personal definition is a person that is like a chameleon that can blend into his environment and that can sit around you and you think that he's on your team, but he's really not. And Michael Thompson was master. He, he was a master of being a chameleon that when it went to dealing with the prison gang or the inmate population, he knew the shuck and jive. He knew how to talk to them when it, uh, came to talking to officers, but to administration, he knew how to talk to us. So he was, he was brilliant when it came to uh, manipulation. Very smart guy, very smart, not a stupid man at all, but he had a hit on him from the Aryan Brotherhood because of what happened where they killed uh, that Aryan Brotherhood. I don't know if it's a girlfriend and the two kids, but what he said was true that he, he, did, he wasn't down with that. And uh, he ended up, turning on the Aryan Brotherhood. And, um, but at one time he could raise his hand and have you come missing and no one would ever find your body. Now he's on the list of probably the Aryan Brotherhood. I know he's on the list where, you know, they want to get him, but I, I think Michael Thompson doesn't hide from anybody. And, um, I, you know, I, uh, I commend him for trying to do the right thing now and hopefully he turns his life around, but I was around him so much and he was around us so much. He was like a chameleon. You almost lose that us and them. Mental. I'll give you an example of uh, James. He got a female Lieutenant fired. He got my Lieutenant fired. He had a sexual inappropriate relationship with my female Lieutenant. And she got fired because she was, he was her clerk and her name was women Peruzzi and Michael and her had this thing going on and he manipulated her way and found, you know, he, he, whether I'm not saying it was all his fault, but you know, she lost the focus of what her job was in that line and crossed the line and had some uh, inappropriate relations with Michael Thompson and she was fired. But, um, the fact that you were able to pick up on that, this guy is an intelligent guy. He's very nonviolent. And everything he said about Charles Manson was true. How Charles Manson was like a schoolboy compared to what me and Michael Thompson saw, like a Juan Corona who killed over 20 some migrant workers and cut their heads off. I mean, Charles Manson never looked into the camera and took responsibility for anything. He always blamed it on somebody else. He blamed it on the girls. He blamed it on the blacks. Uh, Charlie, but Charlie came from, he was raised, uh, he was born up in Ohio. He, his mother was a, um, a, a drug addict. He was given away for drugs. She was a prostitute. He went into the juvenile system. Charles Manson went into the juvenile system. He was molested. He was beat down. And trust me, I'm not a sympathizer to criminals. I'm not a sympathizer to crime. I'm very hard on it. But I also recognize if a kid comes out of an environment that doesn't have a chance from the get-go, then he's going to be a product of that environment. So then Manson went into the adult system. He's a little guy and he was beat down and, you know, he was, uh, he, he learned how to be a convict and he learned with his music. He was a musician and his gift of gab that that kind of brought peace into his life to where people would listen to his gift of gab. But as far as when people that have worked with Manson and Thompson will tell you the same thing, compared to what we were exposed to, Charles Manson was uh, a lot of media built. And uh, we, Michael Thompson and myself and everybody else that worked at Corker State Prison have seen evil face to face. And it was a lot worse than Charles Manson. But um, there were also nonviolent drug offenders in there. You know, you could be, it could be you, James. Say you got caught with a little weed on the main line. And um, 
they roll you up for like say three months and they send you to the hole for three months and you come over to the shoe and you roll up into my cell and I say, Hey, who are you with? And you're like, what do you mean? Who am I with? Like, who are you going to fit in with? And you say, I'm not, I'm not down with that. Oh, you're going to be down with it now because you're in my cell. So see Charles Manson, like he's always pleaded his innocence and says he was set up. Like, is he an absolute psychopath? Because he never done it. Did he never, he never done any of the murders? Is that correct? He was never, they, they killed somebody at the ranch and buried him at the ranch. And I think Charlie was involved with that. I know he cut a guy's ear off and uh, at the ranch and he's admitted to that. But he's always blamed somebody else. You know, a true killer, a true convict will look you in the face and, and, and he'll own his, his work. And uh, Charlie's always diverted it He's never stepped like Sirhan Sirhan. Let's talk about let's talk about one man that changed the course of history in America with his one action. By killing Bobby Kennedy, I've never met another man that changed the course of history. By killing Bobby Kennedy, this one man changed the course of history because Bobby Kennedy was gonna become president of the United States and he would have pulled everybody out of Vietnam. So this one man action of taking the life of Bobby Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, changed the course of history. But Sirhan Sirhan worked in the offices with Michael Thompson. And if you met him, James, you would say, what a gentleman. Never been in trouble his whole time in prison. I don't know if you ever saw the movie The Manchurian Candidate, where it's kind of like the, um, the CIA, and they click their fingers and they bring out another personality. I, there was a lot more behind Sirhan Sirhan than killing Bobby Kennedy. He was a, he was a gentleman. I mean, he had never been in trouble, very intelligent, would never talk about his crime. And um, so Charlie loved the attention. Charlie, Charles Manson loved the attention. Do you believe in MK Ultra? Have you what is that? MK Ultra? It's like, see this man who killed Bobby Kennedy, like they've manipulated the brain to then for people to go. That's what I'm telling you. Yes. I, yes. Because if they look, if you look at that story, James, in the in the in the door frame, and that that revolver had six shots, and I believe they found eight bullets, and there was something more to that than just Sirhan Sirhan. He was a shooter, but I think there was another shooter, and I think just exactly what you said, some kind of uh, someone did something to make him go into some kind of mode. Because if you ever met that man, you would say this guy is a gentleman. But majority of psychopaths are like, because they believe in their own methods of they're sane when they're actually fucking right. insane. Like, was Charles Manson, how could he manipulate so many women to do such ruthless things? Like, did you see that manipulation tools with right. Charles? Did they ever try and manipulate you in any way? Absolutely. Absolutely, I did. Absolutely. And, 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 uh, I think that you're very versed in the prison environment. And so what I'm about to tell you, you'll understand. Charles Manson would find common ground. For me, he read my last name, which is Caruso. So he knew that I was Italian. So he would start telling me stories about hanging out with my dad in the mafia in New York City. And then he knew my father and they used to hang out together as gangsters. And so he's trying to find an end with me. And then uh, when he knew I was a Marine and I would come into work, I would look up at his cell and he created this cone hat. He put a, a, like a hat on and he would salute me as the Marine and I would salute him. And then he would go like this to me and I would go like that to him. So he was trying to find a common ground with me to basically have me open up to him. And uh, that's a form of manipulation to say, hey, I know your people. And, uh, but you know, I saw through it. The bottom line is he's a convict. And, and what you see in America today, James, with Black Lives Matter and some of these activist groups, Antifa, where they're feeding the brains of these young college students and young kids to drink the Kool-Aid is the same thing that Charles Manson did. He took that convict mentality to San Francisco and fed those kids that Kool-Aid that convict mentality, and they drink the Kool Aid. It's the same manipulation. Yeah, Michael Thompson. Like we'll go back there. Like nobody likes a snitch or a rat, but 
in all honesty, a man who, who was the leader of the Aryan Brotherhood then came across a hit where two kids were killed, a woman were killed. Were you surprised that he turned against his own and gave evidence? I, re I respect what he done. Like, I do respect that because kids were killed. I have kids of my own, so... But were you a, a man such high up to be running one of the biggest gangs in American prisons to then turn evidence against the Hells Angels? Were you surprised at that? Um, knowing Michael Thompson, I'm not surprised because he... He is a he's a guy that I believe it was hard. I think it was hard for him to even bite into the Aryan Brotherhood in the beginning, and finally he took on. He realized he needed to align himself with somebody. I believe he's Indian. He affiliates with the Indian culture, yeah. and um, yes, Native Americans. And uh, but he, he he's an intelligent guy, so he kind of finds a middle ground. He did training films for law enforcement on how to how they were bringing weapons into the prisons. He provided testimony to law enforcement of how drugs were coming into the prisons. So he's becoming a, an informant for us, and he's also still committing crime on the street. So he's kind of he's kind of shaking the hands from all sides and then running his own little game, and it all kind of closed down on him. And uh, that's why, you know, I think he was in prison so long because he was a major threat because of his intelligence. And he comes off when you meet him. You know, if I saw him on the street, I would go up and say, I would say hello to me. I, he'd probably acknowledge me in it because he knew who I was. I knew who he was. It was almost a mutual respect. But as a convict, he was very dangerous because he knew the inner workings of us. He worked in our office. So when he said that he had those files before those inmates went out there of the intimate and the individuals that were involved, that shows premeditation to me. And I was blown away, but I wasn't surprised. And, but he is, um, you know, he's, he's a dangerous guy, but you know what? To me, a dangerous person is a man that doesn't value his own life, like a guy that'll blow himself up over in Jerusalem or, you know, um, a suicide bomber. Michael Thompson, um, he stood up for law enforcement. He stood up for the Aryan Brotherhood. He stood up, you know, it depended on where his alliance was at the time. But um, he knew when he crossed the line of the Aryan Brotherhood that his life would be in jeopardy. So I do give him respect to have the conscience enough to try to do the right thing. And he paid a price for it over the years. He, you know, they had, they, they got a hit on him. And uh, so I'm not trying to walk in his shoes. And, um, but what he said on your podcast, I believe, I don't know if he was shot 22 times. He might be talking about buckshot pellets and all that. But I believe probably ninety nine percent of what he said. Yeah, he is. He's the real deal. He's the real deal, and uh, he knows exactly what was happening at Corcoran State Prison. What sort of weapons would you see in these prisons, Richard? Well, I mean, out in the general population, you would see bone crushers, and you know, you would see uh, anything they could sharpen into a knife and fixate a handle on. But inside the shoe, inside the maximum security housing unit, um, you wouldn't see any of that. It was all fist fights. Maybe they get a staple and create a blow gun and put the staple in feces and roll like a little tube of paper and put it up in the bars and spit the, try to spit the uh, staple at you with the feces, the bacteria, hoping to stick it in your neck or something. Um, but we had some dangerous people up in the in the in the shoe, and uh, I'll give you another story. We had uh, there's Pelican Bay up in Northern California, and that's another shoe unit. But that hadn't been built when we opened up Corcoran. So Pelican Bay, I want to say, is like 12 hours from Corcoran State Prison. One night, these officers went up to these two this uh, cell that housed two white boys. The two white boys had shaved their head. They both looked the same. 
So the officers went up there and said, Smith, we're transporting you down to Fresno and uh, get your stuff and you're going to court. Well, he knew he was going to court. So he asked, they asked the inmate's number. The inmate gave him the number. They put him in shackles. They put him in the car. They transported him all the way down to uh, Corker State Prison. I don't know. It might be a 14, 15 hour drive. We get him, we get him in our unit, right? And we asked the inmate his name and his number. He gave us the name, but he, he had the wrong number, right? And we look at the transport officer saying, this is not, this is not who's supposed to be here. So now they realize they brought his celly. They messed up, right? So we put this Smith up in the in the cell. And um he starts going crazy in the cell. He starts throwing water, toilet, toilet water out the cell, flooding the tear. He starts spitting. He, I mean, we went up there, we said, we need to knock it off. He's like, you know, fuck you, come in and get me. And we're like, listen, we're gonna come in there and it's not gonna be good. So he tried to stab us with a spear. He had formulated paper and rolled it real tight. And he's trying to stab us through the bars. So we're, we're like, that's enough. So I get my stuff on, I get a shield and my helmet. Back then, James, in the 80s, this was our equipment. I had a helmet, I had a towel on my neck so I wouldn't get stabbed. I had socks over my boots so I wouldn't slip in the shit and piss on the cell floor. And then I was a shield man going in there to hit him. Right, and I had four guys behind me. So this inmate had tried to stab us, right? So we went up there, and we went in that cell, and James, I mean, we beat him down bad. So bad, because he tried to hurt staff, that we had to transport him to the outside hospital. And so we have him cuffed in the emergency room in the outside hospital, because he beat so bad. And... Um, the doctor tells us to come over and look at the x-ray machine. We come over to the x-ray machine, and guess what we saw? Gun. This inmate had dental floss around his molar and a handcuff key in his throat, and he had formulated this plan to try to hurt staff, knowing that he was going to get beat down and get to the outside hospital, and there he would uncuff himself and escape. So he had this big plan, and that's how brilliant they are, that he was about to escape knowing that his actions was going to create this reaction. That's the kind of mentality that we're dealing with. Yeah, that's smart. So how does a man like yourself, Richard, who is a good prison officer, lives by the book, shooting inmates every day with your blocks and preparing for the fights to then potentially helping the inmates with the violence, the killings, all the corruption that goes on in the foot. What was that moment for you to then open your eyes and decide, I want to, to make changes? That's a, that's a good question. And it, it's like a, it's like a Marine or a soldier going to Vietnam and we're drinking the Kool-Aid of our government and we're going in there and we're shooting people that has never done anything to us, but our government says they're bad people. So then we got soldiers or Marines that are crossing the line and hurting women and children. And other soldiers and Marines are honorable saying this is wrong, right? Same kind of thing. That incident that Thompson talked about, Preston Tate, this inmate, they put him out on the yard. They invited a female and others up into the post with a gunner to have kind of be entertained. And then they put, they put Preston Tate, this, who was black, and his cellmate, James out on the yard and then they let two Hispanic combatants out against them and the Hispanics charged them and started uh, striking the two African Americans Tate and James and uh, as a result the gunner told them to stop fighting and immediately there was a 37 wooden block and then immediately a 9 millimeter shot and shot James's head off. Well I had talked to the officers after that and they were all upset about it, saying this shouldn't have happened. You know, they had brought people up there into the control booth to kind of impress them. They brought a female across the prison to impress her up there in the in the gun booth to watch this fight. So when I saw the press release and it said that inmate uh, Preston Tate was the aggressor, that he attacked the Hispanics 
and he was shot as a result of not complying with the officer, I knew that was all lies. I knew it was all lies. So I went to my lieutenant that Thompson was talking about. His name was Rig. And I said, this is, this is, these are lies. This is all wrong. And I started going into files at nighttime with a flashlight and looking, getting the documents and the pictures and all the evidence. And I was accumulating all this evidence, James, to, to, to try to go up my chain of command, to have my chain of command hold these officers accountable, right? But my chain of command was telling me and my lieutenant, keep your mouth shut. That's just the way it is here in corporate. So then I realized, you know what? I need to contact the FBI. So I called the FBI, myself, the lieutenant named Talbot, and Steve Rigg. We got a hold of the FBI, and the FBI got a hold of me and said, Richard Crusoe, we understand that you have evidence at your house of shootings and beatings that are happening at Corker State Prison. We would like to come to your house to see that evidence. And I said, and I said fine, that's, that's, that's fine. Well, I'm thinking, James, that we're all going to work together. All the agencies are going to work together, and we're going to come to a conclusion to stop the violence. And these officers are going to be held accountable for this inmate being shot to death. So that night, before they were going to come to my house, my conscience started getting the best of me. Because my warden at the time, James, I was in so many incidents of use of force. And if you talk to Michael Thompson, he'll tell you Caruso was used over and over and over. He was I was shooting that 37 millimeter every day. I refused to shoot the nine millimeter. I, I was shooting the blocks. So my peers were saying, these inmates don't fear you. You need to shoot one of them to send a message that then they won't come out and fight. But as long as you keep shooting them with the blocks, Caruso, they're going to come out and fight. And I said, I am not going to shoot another human being with a lethal round just to fit into this crew, right? So here I have all this evidence at my house, James, of all these shootings that I stole out of the prison. I put in my lunchbox, in my pants, in my uniform, tape recordings, everything. And the FBI knows I have it at my house. And so I'm at work that night, and my conscience is getting the best of me. I'm about, I'm a Marine. I'm a cop. I'm about to go down this road that when I go down this road, my career is through. It's over with. But what is right? Am I going to be able to live with myself? Because I was going to kill somebody and 100% get away with it. I was about to be promoted to sergeant. I was 100% going to get away with it. But could I live with myself, James? Could I live with myself? And I realized that God is was watching me. And it didn't matter if I was penniless. I needed to do the right thing. And I needed to stop this violence. So that night before I was going to have a meeting with the FBI, I walked up to the warden's office. Now, James, I know you what the, I know you understand the chain of command. A private just doesn't go up to the general's office and knock on the door. You've got to go through channels to get to the general. I'm a, like a private. I'm a correctional officer, and I'm going to knock on the general's door, the man in charge of this prison. And I'm going to look in his face. And I'm going to tell him exactly what I did, exactly who's coming to my house in the morning, and exactly what I took. So I knock on the warden's door, and he goes, he recognizes me, because I was always involved in the cell extractions. He knew me. And uh, he says, come here, Crusoe. I said, sir, I said, what I'm about to tell you, you know, I'm probably going to lose my job over. I said, but, you know, these shootings and killings at Corcoran, they could have been prevented. And there's a specific shooting with an inmate named Tate that was set up. I said, I have a meeting with the FBI in the morning. And I have evidence that I took out of the prison. And his face was just white, just white. And he knew he couldn't tell me, don't meet with the FBI. So he said, go ahead and meet with him. So I'm like, okay. So I went home that night. The next morning, I wake up, James. Now, understand where I live? There's five prisons five prisons around my town. So everything being fueled in that town as far as the economy is through the prison system. It's cop land, all right? And I'm about to expose it. I'm about to jeopardize the income of all these officers. And so I, my wife and I had a little girl at the time. I sent him away. I knew the FBI was coming to my house at eight o'clock. And there's a knock on my door at eight o'clock. And I go to the door and they show me the badges. They said, FBI, 
They go, Richard Caruso, you have evidence in here of shootings and beatings and killings? I said, yes, I do. I invited them in. I took them in the back of my bedroom. I had everything laid out on the bed. And they're nervous. They're all nervous. And I'm like, well, why are you nervous? What's going on? And the female FBI agent said, you, you went to your warden last night and you told them that you took this evidence. I'm like, yeah, I did. I go, he's my boss. I work for them. We're going to all work together and we're going to make this, we're going to hold people accountable. And the FBI said, Richard, it doesn't work like that. We don't, you got these egos involved with the feds don't like the state. The state doesn't like the feds. If you ever go like in America to like a Denny's, you'll see the sheriff's, the sheriff sitting in one corner, state troopers in another corner, and city police in another corner. They won't even talk to each other. So you're dealing with egos. So she was all nervous saying, Richard, you told your warden that you took the evidence. I said, yes, I did. She goes, Richard, there are stu- two state investigators right now on the way to your house, and they're going to kick your door in with a warrant because you stole this evidence out of a state prison, and they're going to have just they're going to have custody of this evidence and jurisdiction on this case unless you turn it over to us right now. They're going to kick your door in, Richard. I'm like, holy shit. I turned it over to the FBI right there. I put my sneakers on. As I'm walking out of my house, James, two cars screech up to the house. And it was those state investigators. They come out and start showing the FBI their badge. And the FBI is telling them, you need to back down. They said, he works for us. What did he give you? And the FBI goes, you don't need to know what he gave us. And the state investigator walks right through the FBI, like parts of it, comes right to my face. And he whispers to me, he goes, did you give him that stuff? And I said, yes, I did. And he just shook his head like this. And he got in his car. The FBI threw me in their car. And now the state is following us. I'm in the FBI's custody. They're following. We're going to Fresno, which is 35 miles, and we're now speeding up to about 90 miles an hour, and the state is behind us. They've been told to back away, back down. This is a federal investigation. Now the FBI is calling in the plates on the state's vehicles because they, the FBI said, we got two scenarios playing out here. One, these are not real state investigators because we told them they need to back down. Or two, what this young guy gave us in this bag is the house of cards is going to bring everything down in the California prison system. Well, that's what it was. And they whisked me up into the FBI building and these state investigators come storming in and said, we want to talk to Caruso. And the head of the FBI came out and said, if you don't leave, we're going to arrest you right now for impeding this federal investigation. So here I am, James, I'm working for them, but I'm cooperating with the feds. I'm trying to to feed them to stop this violence. So they interview me for six hours, James, the FBI. And they're like, Jesus Christ, this is going to be huge, right? So they take me back to my home. I haven't talked to my wife all day. She's scared. She's living there in Topland with my little girl. We pull up to my house. It's dark. And there's a light on in the house. But the side gate is waving in the wind and the fbi told me to stay in the car they got out they drew their weapons they went around the house to clear the house to make sure there was nobody around that house because they knew how vital i was and the information and the witness that i was so they said get in the house we'll contact you in the morning so i get i walk in the front door of my house and my wife jumps into my arm and she's crying saying what is happening what's going on James, within five minutes, there was a knock on the door. And at this time, it's like 10 at night. And this is before cell phones. This is 1994. There's a knock on the door, and I go to the door, and I I look out the window, and it's the two state investigators that have been following us the whole time. And I open the door, and they look at me, and they go, Richard, you work for us. You got to come back to work. Will you interview with us? I said, absolutely, I'll interview with you. I said, I want to do the right thing. Why aren't you cooperating with these guys? They go, can we take you down to the police department and interview you about what you gave the FBI? I said, absolutely. So they take me down to the police department in the town that I was living. They start the recorder. I go on the record for three hours, and they're just shaking their head like, Jesus Christ. You gave them VHS tapes of shootings. You gave them that. You get, and, and they know it's going to be bad. So at this point, 
I didn't know what's going to happen to me, James. We didn't have cell phones, like I said. So they concluded the interview. The, 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 they, they looked like they just saw ghosts based on what they knew I gave them, the FBI. They took me on a ride out to a cotton field. I thought they were going to shoot me in my head right there. They pull up to a cell or to a um, payphone and they dial Sacramento and to the director of corrections at the time. And they tell the director, we have Caruso in their car right now in Boston. It's going to be bad. He gave them incident reports. He gave them pictures. He gave them VHS tapes. It's going to be bad. And he, the director said, tell Caruso, don't go to work for a couple of days and we'll let him know when to come back. And so I'm thinking, you know what? You know, my career is over with. I mean, I just crossed the line. You don't cross. But the reason I crossed it was because I was going to kill someone 100% and get away with that shooting and have to live with killing another human being that didn't have it coming. So the next day, the FBI calls me and they're mad at me because I met with the state investigators. So I'm like this pawn in the middle, trying to do the right thing as a young officer, trying to cooperate with everybody to, to tell the truth, to stop the violence. But you got the feds that don't like the state, the state investigators that don't like the feds, the state's trying to cover up the prison the violence, and the feds trying to expose it. So I'm involved in this huge mess of egos, money, um, and so I go to work and I get word that, uh, the officers involved put a hit on me to be killed. And, uh, so I'm still having to go work in this prison with 6,000 inmates. So I go into my unit and in my unit, there was a guy named by the name of Topo Peters, Benjamin Peters. And he was like second or third in command of the Mexican mafia. He already knew what happened at my house, and he had been in prison. He, he had already got word from the streets of what was going on. And you know what he said to me, James? What? He said, Crusoe, there's nothing that's going to happen to you. There's nothing that's going to happen to your family. And I was shocked. He goes, you stood up for our people. You risked everything for our people. And I was like, wow. He goes, nothing's going to happen to you. So they refused all the gangs, the prison gangs, the people that you call, that we call the bad guys, society, put a protective circle around me and wouldn't let nothing happen to me. And um, that was the only way that I was able to make it in there because they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't, they wouldn't move on me. And, um, so eventually I got emergency transfer to, uh, go up to Vacaville. And, uh, so I'm up there in Vacaville and, uh, the department tried to force me out for it. In the meantime, I get a call from a reporter from the Los Angeles times and his name was Mark A. Rex. And he said, Richard, I know who you are. He goes, you need to tell the public who you are. I said, I don't need to tell the public anything. I don't want my name in the media. They said, Rich, he said, Richard, he goes, let's forget about these officers. What about the construction crew that had the bid to build a new prison? Now they're not going to build it. These politicians, you're tarnishing these politicians. He goes, Richard, you're going to turn the key on your truck and it's going to explode. And nobody's going to know who you are or what you did. Let me tell your story and put it on the front page of the Los Angeles Times. And then once your story is told, there's no reason to retaliate against you. Now they're going to have to be held accountable. So I told my story to Mark Arax, and I came out in the front page of the Los Angeles Times. And after that, that's when uh, Mike Wallace in 60 Minutes got a hold of me. And um, my, I don't know if you ever saw the movie The uh, Insider with Al Pacino. But it was about the whistleblower, Jeffrey Wagbon, who uh, blew the whistle on Big Tobacco. And Al Pacino played uh, Lowell Bergman, who was the producer in my piece. And uh, so I, I did 60 Minutes. And uh, so, but no indictments were coming down, James. I mean, the feds were sitting on this. And the reason they were sitting on it is they realized that five prisons surrounded the federal courthouse, the venue. So during voir dire, which is jury selection, 
there's going to be people on that jury that has a family member working at the prison that has, you know, connections to, to staff and to get the conviction is going to be hard. So the feds just kind of sat on it, but it was in the media constantly. And the U S attorney was, <clears throat> excuse me, was hammering me to stop the media, Richard, stop the media because the citizens, people like yourself were saying, we need to hold them accountable. Why aren't you indicting? So we're talking, Three years of me having to endure every day, not knowing if I'm going to live. And so finally, the word came down that the state was doing investigation, right? They're going to do an investigation on the allegations that are in the media. Well, we all knew that the state was going to investigate. We had over, we had over a thousand shootings, James, with the block gun. We had lethal shootings where inmates were killed, right? So I'm thinking they're going to go in there and reopen it all, right? And so the state does this joke of an investigation. The feds are doing their investigation. I'm looking over my shoulder. I got prison gang members, street gang members. This, this book right here, this book inside the crypts, Los Angeles most dangerous street gangs. You got you got Crips, you got street gang members putting me in their books talking about the officer at Corcoran that blew the whistle to stop the violence. This is how much they appreciated, you know, me stepping forward to stop the killings of their people. But it wasn't because of that. I did it because I couldn't live with it in my conscience, taking another man's life that didn't have it coming. So here I am going for years of having to endure. When are the feds going to indict? When are they going to get off their ass and do something? So finally, listen to this, James. For finally, for three years, I'm feeding the FBI all this evidence. I get a call that I need to meet the FBI and the U.S. attorney that I initially met with initially in San Francisco in my attorney's office, right? So I tell my wife, they're going to indict they're going to indict these officers. So I go into my attorney's office because now I'm suing the department civilly because they're trying to force me out. So I'm saying to myself, I'm in my 30s. There's no reason. I'm a cop. There's no reason why I should have to retire because I'm doing the right thing. So I'm fighting the department. And so um, I go into my attorney's office and the U.S. attorney that I met with the first day this happened is sitting across from me. The FBI, the two FBI agents that were in my house are sitting across from me. And I'm, I'm kind of waiting for a pat on the back and a thank you, right? Because for years, I've been risking my life for this agency, for the FBI. You know what they did, James? What? The U.S. attorney looked at me and said, Richard, you know that the FBI, or that the state investigators have been doing an investigation also. Well, they sent us a memo saying that you set a child molester out on the shoe yard and shot a child molester with the wooden blocks. And I'm stunned. I'm looking at my attorneys. I'm looking at my wife. My wife starts crying. I go, are you believing the people that you were called dirty? I go, you don't think you're trying to tarnish the star witness? I, and he looked at me, he goes, listen, I'm going to offer you four years in a federal prison if you plead guilty to this. Shut his book and walked out. I'm like, holy shit, they're all in bed together. They're going to indict these officers, and they're going to get Crusoe. I never did anything like that. So I looked at my attorneys, and I'm like, I never did that. I never did anything like that. And they said, Richard, we see what they're doing. They're going to get these officers, and they're going to do state a favor and get you. I said, well, I tape recorded every time I talked to the FBI, I tape recorded them. And my attorneys were like, do you have those tape recordings? I said, yes. I go, they never said I was a target. They said I was a hero. They said if they had that investigation, all the evidence, they would have thrown in a dumpster. They told me all this on tape. He said, Richard, he goes, I got a high powered attorney. I want him to listen to those tapes. So I went to him and he said, you give me $10,000 and I'll listen to these tapes. and I'll do what I can do. He listened to the tapes. He met a meeting. He had a meeting with that U.S. attorney and the two FBI agents. And he goes in there and he looks at the U.S. attorney. He says, Mr. U.S. attorney, that kid is a hero. You told him he's a hero. He put his life on the line for years for you. 
And he goes, didn't you tell him this? Didn't you tell him that? So he's speaking verbatim what they told me on the phone. Now the U.S. attorney realizes Caruso's got tapes of us. He goes, we're not going to indict Richard. And he goes, you're goddamn right. You're not going to indict Richard. My attorney folds his book in books, right? After that, James, I testify in front of the Senate. I changed, changed the Department of Correction forever. The shooting stopped. They extended the academy at the Correctional Academy. They got a, um, now there's lie detector tests uh, for uh, before you're getting hired. There's psychological evaluations. All this stuff came down as a result of what I did. And so there was an election. It was an election year. And at the time, the Republican uh, governor wanted to build more prisons, build more prisons, build more prisons. A Democrat got in there, and I'm a Republican. But the Democrat or the Republicans wanted me dead. They wanted me silenced, right? So a Democratic governor gets in there named Davis, and the, the head of the, the Senate hearing, Senator Richard Polanco, the one that I helped change the department by showing him everything I gave the FBI for three days. I met with him and briefed him on everything. He went to the governor and he said, we need to take care of Caruso. So the governor of the state of California has his people call me at my house and inform me, Richard, the governor of the state of California has ordered the Department of Corrections to settle your civil lawsuit. And I'm like, are you serious? He goes, yes, for what you did for us. He goes, he's not only, he's also going to give you his personal attorney to sit at the table with the other, with the state across from you and their attorneys. So, James, for two years, I've been in depositions with these attorneys from the Department of Corrections looking at me like I'm a piece of shit because I broke the code of silence. Now I'm going to be sitting at a table in the pyramid building in San Francisco with the same attorneys looking at me. And now I got the governor's attorney sitting with me and the judge. You know, my attorney says, Your Honor, this kid's been a, a, a cop since he's been 19 years old, there's no reason why he should have to reach for a Burger King uniform because he did the right thing. And they're writing down all kinds of stuff. They take me back in a room. They come back with a number. I refuse that number. Now, remember, these are the state that said that I shot 37 millimeter at the child molester, right? Why are they offering me anything if that is true? So I'm in the other room. And, you know, they're, they're writing numbers down, making me offers to stop my lawsuit. So finally, I said, this is the number that I want. And I said, they said, we have to call the governor to get this number approved. So the governor gets on the phone with me. He said, Richard, he goes, this is the most a whistleblower has ever gotten in the state of California. He goes, what you did was so out of the realm for someone to do the right thing. He goes, but don't push our face in it. He goes, go on with your life, live a happy life. He goes, but don't push the state of California's face into it every chance you get. And I said, sir, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, I come back into the room and now those attorneys for the state, they've been calling me a piece of shit for two years. Guess what they tried doing, James? What? They come up to me and start hugging me, wanting to hug me, saying, we know you're a good guy. We know, I say, get the, get off of me. You're dirty. You're just as dirty as them. They're just dirty. Yeah, that's a main fuck. I know. I know. I know. So it doesn't stop there. So now I just got the highest settlement to a whistleblower in the state of California given to me by the governor of California. And if I was a dirty cop, that would never happen. So now I'm in the gym and I'm working out and I'm, I'm living in Napa, California. And I come home and there's a white car sitting outside my house. I know that white car. That's the FBI. So the FBI gets out and shows me his badge. And he goes, Richard, you know, we're about to have the trial. We need you. We need you. I said, fuck you. I said, you wanted to put me in jail for four years. He goes, Richard, we shouldn't have believed them. I said, you're goddamn right. We should. He goes, hey, Richard, they just gave you that money. Obviously, you're not what they say. I said, exactly. I go, and you wanted me to take a deal to do four years in a federal prison on something I didn't even do? I said, I'm not coming. 
I'm not testifying. I said, if you want my testimony, I said, take it off of my uh, transcript in the grand jury. And um, so I go inside the house and I call the CBS Evening Newsroom in New York City. I said, I need to speak to Mike Wallace for 60 minutes. And Mike gets on the phone. He goes, Richard, what's wrong? I said, Mike, they want me to testify in this trial. I said, Mike, they've already picked the jury down there. They got people on that jury that their family members work at Corcoran. I go, this trial is going to be a sham. They want it to go away, James. They want all of it to go away because they don't want to open up Pandora's box. Of all those inmates that were shot in Maine, they killed the lawsuits and millions and millions and millions of dollars. They want this to go away, right? So Mike Wallace says, Richard, you started this ball rolling. You need to go down there. You need to do the right thing, and you need to testify. And he goes, I'll be in the front row there supporting you. And 60 Minutes was behind me the whole time. So I go down to the federal courthouse in Fresno. I get out of my car, James, and the press is all over, clicking pictures, pictures. Here comes the witness, right? So I get, in, I get into the courthouse, and the defense attorney, they're already about a week and a half in, in, into the trial. And the defense attorney sees me coming in, and he wants to have a sidebar with the judge. So they dismiss the jury, and they and the, the defense says to the judge, if Caruso brings up the settlement that we just gave him to the, in front of that jury, we're going to ask for a mistrial. So the judge says, okay, well, if you talk, if you bring up money, then Mr. U.S. Attorney, you can follow up and, and talk to Richard about that situation. So the U.S. Attorney comes out into the room and says, Richard, you can't bring up the settlement the money they just gave you. I said, wow, the jury's not even gonna, gonna hear that, you know, that, that that those people over there that say that I'm a bad person just gave me this settlement, right? So they had me up on the stand, James, and they start talking, they don't wanna talk about what happened. They, they said, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is all in the head of Richard Caruso in his imagination, high speed chases, um, the deadliest prison in America. They said, it's all, he goes, Richard, what do I have in my hand right here? What is this I'm showing you? And I said, it's a contract of Paramount Pictures. Paramount Pictures, ladies and gentlemen, he is in a contract with Paramount Pictures. He goes, Richard, what is the number on that contract right there? What does that number say that you're going to make if this movie with Paramount Pictures uh, gets made? I said seven hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Seven hundred and sixty, ladies and gentlemen, the jury. Seven hundred and sixty thousand dollars. He goes, Richard. Right here is where he messed up, James. Richard, that's probably the most money you've ever made. I looked at the jury. I said, No, they gave me a lot more. Those guys gave me a lot more over there. And the jury's face is like, What? And so he realized he messed up, and he goes and sits down. Now Mike Wallace is waiting. For the U.S. attorney, stand up, stand up, ask Richard why he made more than $700,000 because they gave it to him. But the U.S. attorney wouldn't stand up to clean it up. The U.S. attorney just sat there. So 60 minutes and every, everybody saw they're throwing this trial. They're throwing it. They want him to come back down guilty, end the story, clean our hands with it, move on. Nobody else gets sued. That's exactly what happened, James. That's exactly what happened. So I ended up making a movie based on my true life story with Val Kilmer, Sam Shepard, Ann Archer. You can see the poster in the back called Felon. And it came out in 2008. We filmed it in 2007. I was a producer on it and I helped write it. And I also acted in the movie. And uh, it's based on the violence at Corcoran State Prison. And... Um, I use my story, I travel the country now, and I use my story to talk about how one person can make a difference and stands by his beliefs, even if there's a threat of losing your life. I knew that every time I turned the key on my truck, that it could explode. But I said, God, if that happens, I'm at peace, knowing that I did the right thing. So for over three years, I lived every day like that. But you would be surprised there were good cops and good officers and good and the people in the public. If I if I was abandoned by the good cops, the good officers and the good people in the public, 
psychologically, I wouldn't have been able to make it, James. And um, so I go around uh, the United States now, and I, I talk about integrity in law enforcement, doing the right thing, the code of silence, uh, repercussions of blowing the whistle, um, what your word means. Uh, fortunately for me, James, I had the power of the media. They were behind me 100%. They heard tape recordings. They believed in me, right? Most whistleblowers don't have that. So they get eaten up by big organizations, big companies. They get starved out. So my heart goes out to those people that try to do the right thing, but psychologically and financially, they can't make it. They kill themselves. They, they, they financially go bankrupt. But because I had powerful media behind me because of what the subject was, and I had good cops, good officers, and good the public embrace me that couldn't believe that this kid was taken out of the state of California, the biggest prison system in America, to hold them accountable. They stood behind me, and that's how I was able to make yeah. it. So you're taking on the biggest prison in America, you're taking on the prison, biggest prison state in America. You've got the evidence of the killings, the beatings that shouldn't have happened. You've then turned it all into the FBI, but then you're sitting there and they're potentially going to send you to prison for four years, but you've recorded those phone calls. If you haven't hadn't recorded those four phone calls, uh, those those phone calls, you would have been sent to prison then and potentially been killed. A prison officer uh, going to prison would have been killed 100%, but... So if 100%. You have, what gave you the the idea to record them? I didn't. I, I got to the point to where I realized that every day I could lose my life, and I didn't start. I, I start being paranoid where I didn't trust anybody. So every phone call that came in, I recorded it. So every time the FBI called, I pressed record. But everything that you just said, James, you are a hundred percent right. I would be in prison. I probably would have been killed in prison. But because I had those recordings. They didn't do it. They were all dirty, James. They were all dirty. Yeah, that's sad, but this is the way of the world, brother. So when you're, um, what sort of things, how extreme was the beatings of the inmates and the killings of the inmates while you were there? How, how bad was it for other officers? Were they getting enjoyment out of just killing and beating people every day? No, no. It was, there wasn't enjoyment. But what happens, it's like a soldier, a Marine, when you're at war, you become, you become desensitized. Your supervisors and people in government in Sacramento are giving you awards and saying you're doing a good job. And uh, so you become desensitized. So I was desensitized saying, hey, we're getting data boys for doing our job. And we know that they're going to come out and fight. That's the key, James. What you said early in this interview, Richard, why are you putting them out there if you know they're going to fight? That's the whole key to the whole case. Why are we putting them out there knowing they're combatants? And so they, they weren't getting joy. But unfortunately, you'll have bad apples in any organization that will take it too far, James. And that's what happened at Corcoran. We had some bad apples. We had some bad administration. And Michael Thompson... Michael Thompson saw it all. Yeah, that's crazy. So, because some of the, on, in some of the reports, was I not, um, like, I think it was June 1995, 30 guards beat 36 black men who were chained and shackled and just beating them coming off the bus. Is this correct? Come, coming from Calipatria, yes. James, did, did, you see the, did you see the report about the booty bandit? What was that? The, I sent you a video of 60 Minutes to the story about the booty bandit. He was a murderer, a black murderer, and the officers would put young black males in there that would be a mouthy, and he, they'd give the booty bandit extra lunches to rape and molest them. And so he would be sodomizing these young guys, and the guys were clawing at the cell door trying to get out, and the officers would just walk by as he's get, as they're getting sodomized, and I I already sent you that link of sixty minutes with a story on it, and uh, but that's the booty bandit. If you Google the booty bandit, Cork in prison, it's right there. That was yeah, the because, environment change because the 
did they not say that people in the bus were stabbing each other? But what they would do is plank, bury the knives in some of the inmates' ha- hair. So when they came off the bus, yeah. it would give them a, an yeah. excuse to beat those kids. Yeah, you 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 got power over other human beings that are not being checked by an outside eye, James. And I don't care if it's over in Scotland. I don't care if it's in America. If you don't have outside eyes watching you and keeping you in check, we're going to we're going to invent our own code of silence and what we can and can't do. And then there's always going to be people that cross that line. And unfortunately, that's what happened in this situation is people were crossing the line. For instance, say a say an inmate got his breakfast one morning and said it was cold. And said, "Hey, you know, my breakfast is cold, Officer Jones." And Jones just keeps walking. And then all of a sudden he says, Jones, I, I said my breakfast is cold. And Jones just keeps walking. All of a sudden the image is like, well, fuck you, Jones. Well, all of a sudden Jones looks back and says, what did you say? And the inmate just looking at him. And Jones leaves. Four hours goes by. The inmate's getting ready to go out to the handball courtyard. And guess who's up in the gun? Jones. To shoot him for saying, fuck you. He might only get shot with the blocks, but that's the kind of stuff that was happening was you're going to face a repercussion for disrespecting me. How and many it killings? It was, yeah. How many killings were in this prison? I want to say there were, th- that statistic, I would just be taking a ballpark guess. I want to say, now we opened like in 88, late 87, and this had only been open when I came forward and blew the whistle, like seven years. And I want to say we killed, I want to say seven or eight, but we shot with lethal rounds many. And there were over a thousand shot with blocks. There were over a thousand shot with blocks. What was it like seeing a prisoner who was shot and killed? I would have him come out. I would be, I, I was also a gun officer. And I would be up in the gun and they would come underneath me and they're in shackles and they would look up at me and they would look out on that yard and they would see their enemy waiting for him. He's out there boxing, getting ready, shadow boxing. We know what's going to happen. Now this guy is going to get uncuffed and go through that door. And he looks up at me and says, Caruso, please don't kill me today. Please don't kill me today. You know, I got to fight. And I, I, and I would tell him, I'd say, just don't have a weapon. Don't have a weapon. And I shoot the blocks. This like this right here. Let me see. Where is it? Right here. These right here. Little wooden blocks. There was five five of them. Can you see that? Yeah. Five of the, five of these projectiles, and they're like little, you know, like the ABC blocks you have as a kid. Wooden. Yeah. And they would, they would come out of a canister and hit them in their knees. And that's what I would use. Okay. I was not going to shoot another man over fist fights. And these individuals, these convicts were getting shot over fist fights. And they were getting killed over fist fights. No weapons. No weapons. And we so, knew it was going to happen. So the killing should have been prevented, basically, if it was only fist fights and no weapons? A hundred percent could have been prevented by segregating the yards. Whites go out with the whites, blacks go out with the blacks, Mexicans, just like it was at Folsom, Tehachapi, and San Quentin. But the reason they didn't do that, because they wanted to build more prisons, build more prisons, build more prisons. So to the public, they're like, oh my God, they're out of control in Corcoran. You know, we need to build more prisons, pay these officers, the, you know, the, whatever they want. And they use the fear of violence to justify all the financial gain. Well, that's all it is, brother. You've just answered it there. It generates money. The more prisons, the yes. more inmates, the more money. I think it's 40 or 50 yes. grand per inmate in the UK. So the more prisons, the more money it makes. But for you exposing it and opening it up and changing the game, like it takes a lot of strength. What's the worst thing Richard you'd seen as a prison officer? Um... Lots of people get shot. Worst thing I saw was I was on a weight pile and um, the Hispanics were on the weight pile. And um, 
We had one yard guard officer, thousand in, a thousand inmates on the yard, and you had about 200 Hispanics working out with weights. And I was standing there, and uh, this inmate was laying, this Hispanic inmate was laying on the bench, and he had preacher, he was at a curling bar, right? But he was doing preachers off his head, laying on his back. And I saw this other Hispanic inmate carrying a dumbbell, an 80-pound dumbbell, across the weight pile like he was going to use it. And he walks over there by the, the Hispanic inmate that was doing the preacher curls like this, and he smashes it right down on his head. And he almost takes the head off. It just hung, killed him immediately. And the body was just shaking. And the inmate that did it just turned, put his hands up, turned around. We cuffed him up, took him out of there. But uh, just his, his head was just hanging by like a thread right in front of me. I mean, I, I still think about it. Who's the most dangerous prisoner you've been in contact with? That I had contact with? Yeah. I would I would say I would say Juan Corona. If you look at his crime, if you look at his Google his crime, he killed a lot of people, a lot of immigrant workers. And when you and, and when you're around these convicts, this is something that you picked up. When you look in when I would look in Thompson's eyes, Michael Thompson or anybody, I don't see evil. I see a master manipulator, very smart man. But when you look in someone like Juan Corona's eyes, I see blackness. I see darkness. I see evil. Thompson didn't have that look. Thompson did not. Thompson, Thompson used his skills very effectively. Very effective. Yeah, to survive. Like, so all on out, what, what was the, the outcome then with having all the evidence against the prison system? What was the whole outcome? Did people get convictions or... Was people sacked? How did it work? Or is it just a case everything swept under the carpet? They indicted those eight officers and they were found not guilty. And like I said, they were, the jury was made up of people that had family that worked there. So after that, the, the shooting stopped because now I shined a light on it. They started segregating the yards. They wouldn't put them out there together anymore. Blacks were all blacks, whites were whites, Mexicans were Mexicans. So they started segregating the yards. Um, like I said, it changed the system. It stopped the violence. It was an easy fix, James. It was an easy fix to where you or anyone from the streets would say, why are you mixing these guys up in a, in a yard the size of a handball court when for years they've been segregated and they're enemies? They're, they, they hate each other. Well, they wanted them to fight. Yeah, because the more violence, then the more prisons they can, they can create as well. Uh, Michael right. Thompson said he, he could smuggle guns into prison. How far-fetched is that, or is that legit? He, uh, Michael Thompson, you know, I can say what I said about him. The guy did 45 years. He's seen it, been there, done that. And uh, if he smuggled guns in, then I believe he did it. He talked about using Manson's girls. I believe it. You know, there wasn't much I didn't believe about what he said except being shot 22 times. And maybe he's talking about buckshot. But I know that my Lieutenant Talbot did shoot him in the leg. I think he shot him at either Soledad or Chino. But Michael Thompson, um, if you were standing by him on the street, you wouldn't think he's a bad guy. And you know, maybe he is, uh, you know, because he has cooperated with law enforcement and trying to do the right thing now with addiction and addicts and stuff. Maybe he has uh, changed his life around. I pray that he has. But at one point, he was a very powerful individual. He uh, he knew the inner workings in the offices inside the shoe. He knew the gossip. He knew the good officers, the bad officers, the officers that were the sharks, the ones that weren't. He'll tell you, Caruso was one of them. Caruso, I was the shield man always going into these cells. But then I came to that fork in the road when I saw the, the inmate take the guy's head shot off and say, wait a minute, they're lying. These guys are lying. He didn't, he didn't attack anybody. So when I saw my people lying to cover up this killing, 
That's what the fork in the road. And then they started saying that I needed to shoot an inmate with a real bullet to get blood on my hands to ensure that I would keep my mouth shut. And I refused to do that. Do you think they were trying to force you in to shoot someone or kill someone so you were on their team, basically, and you couldn't turn yes. against them? Did you think you were, already, right. you were already becoming a threat towards your own? Of course, of course. But when you have the conviction of that you did the right thing and you've already faced the, the um, possibility of you're probably going to die in the process of seeing this through, I'd already accepted that I'm probably not going to make it out of this, right? And even if it was by my own hand, because of the stress, I used to have a full head of hair before all this. <laughs> even if it, even if it was before the stress, right? <laughs> so, so um, I'd already accepted my fate. And um, recently, I was doing a charity event for Prince Harry down in Los Angeles. And um, I was in the hood. I don't know if y'all ever saw the movie Training Day with Denzel. Yeah, great film. There's a scene in that movie where those gang members got Ethan Hawke in the tub and they're going to kill him. And they pull the wallet out of it. They go, how'd you get this wallet? Right? I was in the hood and this Mexican mafia member walked up on me. I sent you the video. And uh, he said, what are you doing in our neighborhood, Holmes? And I saw the handprint of the Mexican mafia on his chest. So I knew who he was. And I said, well, I'm doing something for veterans. He goes, right on. I go, you done time in, in uh, California? He goes, yeah, the 90s. I go, me too. And he had shades on. I, I go, where were you? He said, Corcoran. I said, me too. He goes, what's your name? I said, my name's Caruso. Brother, he stepped toward me, and I, I had to eat to the hawk moment. He stepped towards me. I didn't know if he's going to whistle and all the homeboys were going to come out. I didn't know if he's going to hit me. He grabbed me and he hugged me. And he goes, do you know what your name means in this neighborhood? He goes, do you know all the sons and husbands that you saved by turning those guys in? I said, I said, brother, can I tape record this? And I started videotaping them because they had been, this is 2019, and I, this is like 20 years ago. But they remember when you do people wrong, James, they don't forget. And karma comes full circle. And that's the moral of this story is karma. You put bad out there in the world, and 99% you might get away with it. But God forbid you, you meet that reaper, that 1%, and you have to atone for something you did bad that was evil because karma will come knocking at your door. Yeah. Is there much suicides in these prisons, Richard? Because the UK... There's a lot of suicide, but some people say that the inmates wouldn't commit suicide. There's a, a crew here in prison officers called the Mufti Crew, and they come in with the shields and they come in at like 3 a.m., 4 a.m. But some people say that people get killed because they're so ruthless and dangerous in prison. They'll hang them, leave them, and it'll get passed as a suicide. Is there much stuff like that happens with the prisons that you worked in? I will tell you this, and I hope that this doesn't get edited out of our podcast, but I'm going to be honest with you. 90% of people that get involved in law enforcement, 90% that people are in our military, they are honorable, outstanding citizens, officers doing a dangerous job every day. But you're going to have that 10% in any, in any organization that is going to cross that line. But what's, what has to happen, James, is when they cross that line, the organization, the Department of Corrections, the U.S. government, whoever, they need to be held accountable. They need to take corrective action and get them out of there. By condoning them and protecting them, you're only enforcing to keep your mouth shut that you're doing the right thing. So I don't know how it is over in the U.K., but back in the day here, we had mandatory sentencing laws for nonviolent drug offenders. So if you got caught with some cocaine, depending on the weight, you might get locked up for life because it takes the, the discretion out of the judge's hand because the federal law says if, if there was this much weight, you got to do this much time. So prisons were just being filled up with these nonviolent drug offenders. You've got to have another answer for drug offenders, uh, James. 
It's a, it's a sickness. It's an addiction. Yes, they steal. They do what they can. They get their dope. But I cannot sit back and judge another man that's dealing with an addiction like that because I have friends and family that have dealt with that. Yeah. Who was the guy, Danny Roman, who got killed, the Mexican mafia man, who got stabbed to death? I think that happened at Folsom. Folsom Prison. Yeah. 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 They had to... Uh, they they smuggled in a forty five round. We had word that these inmates were coming off the bus, and I think Thompson talked about this. But we got word that an inmate had a forty five round up his ass, and they were going to uh, shoot a sergeant, one of my sergeants, and they were going to make a homemade gun. And all they'd have to do is put that round in the barrel and strike the primer. And sure enough, we got that inmate off the bus, and we put him on potty watch. We made him a shit. In a plastic bag, and he had a forty-five round up his ass. Was there many hits out in your own life, Richard, from other inmates before all the whistleblowing stuff happened? You're working in, in, in a dangerous jungle. I mean, Corkin was a jungle, and uh, as an officer, being involved in so much activity because I'm doing cell extractions, I'm doing. You, you got a target on your back, but what gets you through, James? And this is what gets you through. And this is how you survive is by your integrity and your word. When convicts believe that your word means something, then you'll be fine. If you go in there and you're a tough guy and you think you're going to beat on these convicts and, and you're going to win in the end, they got all day to beat you and you're going to lose. I don't care how big you are. You're going to lose. So with me, you know, being a big guy, I was fair. I was firm. You know, if I had to take care of business, we took care of business. When I came to that crossroads where I saw inmates being killed that didn't have it coming, I knew that I could not be a part of this. And I was, I threw everything away, my career, everything, my Marine Corps, everything to just save lives. And that's what I did as I went forward and I stole all that evidence and started the biggest investigation ever to hit the Department of Corrections in the state of California. Yeah. How's life like for you now, Richard? Um, I could sit there like some people that deal with PTSD that have been in war or whatever, and they get involved in bad behavior and say, well, it's because I was involved in war or it's because, you know, I was beat as a child. But I don't use my situation that I was involved in in California as an excuse for bad behavior now because I believe in choices and consequences. If I'm going to make a consequence for bad behavior now, then um, then I'm going to, or if I'm going to make a choice for bad behavior, I'm going to have to face the consequence. I can't blame what happened at Corcoran State Prison and what I went through as, as horrible as it was. And it, it's not, you know, it, it was it was nightmarish for years and years and years. Life for me now, I am embraced by good people in law enforcement, good people in our military, and I embrace them. I go out there and I extend my hand and I make a difference and I make these individuals feel better than when I left them. And I do it on my dime. And uh, so I, I, get, I, I talk to troubled youth. I go into the troubled youth uh, homes and I talk to them. They think they're, you know, mere gangsters and they're little wannabes. And I put my 60 minute tape on and then I talk about fell in the movie and then their eyes light up and now I got their attention and now they're listening to me, you know, and I'm sitting there telling them, be careful what you mirror because you're going to have to go in there and you're going to have to have the mentality. You're going to be approached. And what do they say to you, James? You're either with us or you're against us. Going forward for the future, brother, what's your plans? Um, basically, I'm just out there paying it forward, uh, talking to veteran groups, trying to help veterans, trying to help law enforcement that are dealing with PTSD. Um, I, like I said, I do it. I don't have a nonprofit. I don't try to make money off it. I just take them to lunch, share with them as brothers or sisters, and uh, put my arm around them, talk them out of that, talk them out of that dark spot they're in. So we have 22 veterans a day that kill themselves, and um, I'm very conscious of that. And I've had people change their lives because of my story, or because I spent time with them. And for me, that is payment. That 
they got through today to see tomorrow. And then I got them through tomorrow to see another week. I motivated a Marine to walk across America and we fed thousands of veterans on his walk. Took him six and a half months to walk across America. And I had Marines watching him the whole way. And I flew out to California and walked the last miles with him to, uh, to thousands of Marines that greeted us. So one person can make a difference, James. And that's the, the moral of my story is that one person can make a difference. And I have made a difference with what I did in California, how I carry myself now, and um, just putting good out there in the world. Yeah, I think the world needs more people like you, Richard. You seem a good guy. You wear your heart in your sleeve. The 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 good worker who is willing to do anything for his job, and thankfully you opened your eyes and helped save other inmates. Because even though people do bad, it doesn't necessarily mean that they are bad. It's just certain circumstances creates the people who they are but people can change people can better their life for anybody that's watching Richard that's, right. that's maybe that's maybe struggling with PTSD what advice would you have for them brother reach out to somebody reach out uh, call a call a, a, a suicide line or reach out to a brother or a sister that you know will pick up the phone in the middle of the night I know I pick up a phone a lot in the middle of the night and um realize that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, think of me, think of my story, walking the deadliest prison in America with 6,000 inmates every day with a hit on my head, but holding my head high with conviction that I did the right thing. And I didn't care what came at me, I would deal with it. I didn't care if I was in the gym, I would hold my head high. And I knew that, you know what, I'll get through today and then there's tomorrow, there's baby steps. But there are people out there that will embrace you and that will put their arm around you and that will help you get through what you're struggling with. Richard, for coming on today and telling your story, brother, it's been very interesting. A lot of people will enjoy this from what you've done, what you went through and what you created to then make change. Would you like to finish up on anything, Richard? I just want to, th I just want to thank you and uh, especially for reaching back out to me and uh, doing the research and raising your hand for me and, um, and uh, supporting me and my story. Um, they may take our lives, James, but they'll never take our freedom. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll finish up on that, brother. But again, mate, listen, it's a great story and you should be proud of everything you've achieved and, and what you're doing. The film, uh, the f film Felon that was on Netflix as well, Val Kilmore, great actor. But... Again, mate, thanks for giving me your time and telling your story. And for anybody that's maybe wanting to get in contact with you, Richard, do you have like a uh, social media or anything that people for people that's maybe struggling in the UK? They can they can they can get a hold of me on Facebook. They can shoot me a message on Facebook. Uh, I'm sure they can go through your show and you can direct them to me. You have my contact information. Yep. And James, uh, I know a little bit about your story, yeah. and. Uh, we had we had UFC fighters in felon. We wanted the fighting to look real. I don't know if you know who Carlos Condit is, the, the UFC fighter, but we had uh, Greg Jackson's dojo in Albuquerque, and we went in there and got all the UFC fighters and came in and come down to audition. So a lot of those inmates that you see on those yards are UFC fighters. But um, I know about your fighting background, and I know about you, and I admire you. And I admire how you've changed your life and you're doing good. And I hopefully that me and you can maintain a friendship besides this podcast. Definitely, my brother. But again, thanks for coming on today, Richard. I wish you all the best for the future. God bless you, brother. Uh, let me know if you watch Felon and how you like it. I will do, Richard. Thank you, brother. God bless. Thank you, brother. And don't hesitate to reach out. Will do it. Likewise.